God of light, thank you for sending the light of the world, Jesus Christ, to save us from the darkness of sin which clung to us so tightly. Thank you that his light breaks through that darkness, revealing to us the, the, that the promises of forgiveness of sin, salvation, and everlasting life are actually given for us. As we read of the light of the star of the epiphany, show us again the light of the gospel, that we might clearly see Jesus. It is in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we are celebrating the epiphany of our Lord. In actuality, as I mentioned earlier, this celebration is scheduled to take place on Wednesday, following the 12 days of Christmas. But like many congregations, we have chosen to move the celebration to this Sunday. The fact is that today is the first time that I will preach about the epiphany of the Lord. Because for the vast majority of churches today, my previous churches included, the epiphany is no longer celebrated with any regularity. It's not that the epiphany is not important. It just seldom falls on a Sunday. A downfall to moving epiphany to the nearest Sunday, which we have done, is that we miss out on the readings which would have normally been preached on for that day. For instance, today, in our regular lectionary, we would have been hearing about the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. Now we just won't hear about that for at least another year. The reading for Epiphany is always on the story of the visit of the Magi, which we read this morning. This story is an immensely popular and well-known story in the scriptures. Because of its popularity, the story seems to have grown with each telling, as fish stories tend to do. So I think that it's a good thing for us to take a look at this reading and to undo a few of the non-biblical traditions which have grown up around it. Take, for instance, the three wise men, wise guys as I sometimes refer to them. Many Bibles refer to them as magi. In the English Standard Version, which we read, it refers to them as the wise men. Our song of the day, which we'll sing in a little bit, refers to them as the three kings of Orient. Based on the Greek, magi is the most accurate translation. Now we know that these men were following a star. And so this would indicate that they were trained, trained in astronomy or astrology. And so they were clearly considered to be educated. And since they were able to put together a caravan to travel to Jerusalem and then on to Bethlehem, these men clearly had wealth behind them. Or they served a king as his court advisors in the countries from which they came. We don't even know how many of these travelers there were. Because of the gifts that were given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the number is assumed to be three. But the scriptures are silent on this number. Three or 30, it really does not make any difference. The number is not important. All we are told in the scriptures is that there's more than one. And we often see camels and wise men in our manger scenes, but it is highly unlikely that these wise men ever made it to the manger. They likely had to travel hundreds of miles to get to Bethlehem. The Bible and this reading does not mention camels, but if you think back to Isaiah, we hear that they came on camels. But nor does it mention that they ever went to the manger. But since Herod was hunting for a boy two years or, or old or younger, it is likely that Jesus was already a toddler at the time these wise men arrived. The Bible does state that they've followed a star. I find it amazing that throughout the centuries, and even in these these last few weeks, for those of you who got up and actually saw the the, uh, star, or the Bethlehem star, uh, astronomers have been trying to find a natural origin for the star. 
In the last few weeks, the reasoning was an alignment of planets. Or it could have been a conjunction of star and planet. I have heard that it was an explosion of a supernova that they saw. Or it could have been a miracle of God. Since this star moved as it guided the wise men and it stopped directly over the place where the child was, I would personally go with the miracle option. With all of this, I have a question which might lead us down a bit of a bunny trail, which you'll hear about as we go into text study. There's a lot of bunny trails that take place. If the wise men were following a star, why did they veer from their course and head to Jerusalem? Could it be that their education kicks in and they decided at some point that since they were seeking the king of the Jews, it made perfect sense to travel to the capital of the Jewish nation? I mean, after all, kings should be born in the presence of royalty, shouldn't they? We read, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. At some point, they stopped following the star and made the decision to take the fork in the road leading to Jerusalem. When they got to Jerusalem, however, they were likely a bit shocked that the king of the country was completely unaware of the birth of a newborn king. We read, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. From history, we know that Herod, in his later years, was mentally unstable, and that's to put it mildly. As we've talked about in the past, Herod even went to the point of killing his own family members, killing a wife and killing a son that he feared might be there to take his throne. When we read that all of Jerusalem was troubled with him, there's good reason. If Herod was troubled, people were going to die. People were going to suffer. In response to Herod's inquiry about the place of the birth of the Messiah, the priests and the scribes search the scriptures and they come up with Bethlehem. They tell him that the king will be born in Bethlehem because it is written by the prophet Micah. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders or rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Armed with this information, Herod summons the wise men and asks them when the star had appeared, and then he sends them off to Bethlehem, saying, Go and diligently search for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Yeah, right. As if Herod had any intention of going to worship anyone, much less the one who would take his place as king. We know that Herod fully intended to kill this baby Jesus. God's mercy and grace appear again as the Magi leave Jerusalem. He once again places the star in the sky to lead them to Jesus. And we read, Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, does that sound like a naturally occurring phenomenon? God, in his mercy, brings the wise men directly to the house where Jesus was by the use of a star. And entering the house, the wise men saw Jesus with his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him, opening their treasures and offering Jesus the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Julian recently showed me a cartoon depicting the three wise women who appeared after the wise men leave. Their gifts, fresh diapers, <laughs> casseroles for a week, and lots of formula. Kind of cute. But 
when you stop to think about it, Joseph was a carpenter. Where did he get the money to take his family ultimately to Egypt and to support this newborn king? What I do find amazing, however, is that there's no record of the chief priests and the scribes, nor anyone else from Jerusalem, for that matter, going with the Magi to search for this child. These priests and scribes had detailed information from God on this event. They had the scriptures, promises telling them that the Messiah would come to them. They had even searched the scriptures and had confirmed the promises for Herod, the king. And still, the scribes and the priests all missed out. Because even though they knew God's word quite well, they really didn't believe it. The wise men came and went, but the chief priests and the scribes stayed in Jerusalem. They missed out on the Messiah. God led the Magi to the Christ child by the way of the star. It was when they decided to follow their own logic that they got lost and ended up in Jerusalem in front of King Herod. God did not abandon them, but waited to lead them along that right path to Bethlehem. The Magi, Gentiles from another country, were introduced to the Christ child by way of a star. The chief priests and the scribes, those who had supposedly been watching and waiting for the Messiah, missed out. These chief priests and scribes are a warning to us. These men, religious professionals, had most of the scriptures memorized. They knew the laws, and they knew the writings of the prophets. And still, even when Jesus began to fulfill the prophecies in their presence, they missed out. Even though they had a tremendous amount of biblical knowledge, they had become false teachers who abandoned the truth of God's word in favor of the false word of man. They had become blinded by their own knowledge and had learned to twist the truth of God, teaching lies instead of truth. Herod was willing to let the Bible direct him as to the choice of his next target in his reign of terror, while at the same time he rejected the words of those scriptures when they talked of his Savior. And this may sound strange, but just think of how many times we are all too happy to use the Bible when it suits our purposes and discard it when it does not. When we want to believe a lie, we can cherry pick all kinds of Bible passages out of context, mind you, to support that lie. Yet when it comes to the truth that the Bible actually teaches, we somehow ignore it or we even criticize it. The devil, the world, and our, our own flesh are only too ready to mislead us into false belief or despair or some other great vice or shame. Yet God is so patient with us. Just as the Magi did, we too reject God's guidance and follow our own logic. But even when we turn from his word again and again, God is always there. He's ready to take us back, ready to provide us with the light of his word, ready to guide us to the Christ. Just as he drew the Magi to Christ by the light of his star, he now draws you to Christ by the light of his word. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. It was Herod's plan to kill this Christ child, but he would fail. Yet the world would eventually execute this same child, but only because it was for this reason that Christ came into the world. His death would happen, but it would happen according to God's perfect plan, not according to the hateful, fear-filled plan of Herod. For when the time was right, when the, this Christ child had grown to become a man, and only when that man had proclaimed the repentance and forgiveness of sin, then, and only then, 
when the fullness of time had come, God allowed sinful men to nail this Christ to the tree. Jesus would die and conquer death for us by his own death. And when he had overcome the power of death, Jesus returned to life, never to die again. In this way, God intervened to save you and me. The perfect life, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ redeemed us from our sins. That's you and me. This includes even our twisting of God's word and our lies, even our lies to ourselves. Jesus' work of salvation lay in the future when the Magi visited him. Therefore, God moved in history this time to warn the Magi about Herod's plan and to warn Joseph, his father, as well. Jesus did indeed have an appointment to die, just not in Herod's time. God sent an angel to Joseph and warned him in a dream, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph arose from sleep and immediately took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, remaining there until the death of Herod. God moved in history to protect his son, Jesus Christ, so that when the time was right, Christ could move to save us. God's special light, the star, was a unique invitation to the Magi, an invitation in a form that they would be able to understand. God chose that star to draw the Magi in his mercy and his grace. Today, God still draws people to himself. When God's word has its way with us, when there is no rationalizing away its true meaning, then the Holy Spirit uses that word to draw us to Jesus. When we try to twist God's words to serve our own purposes, when we rely on our own logic or or our feelings, instead of believing the word, it is then that we lose our way. And we miss out. When the word of God works in us according to its truth and its purity, then the light of the world breaks through the darkness and the Holy Spirit uses it to build faith and give us forgiveness of sin and life and salvation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these are God's promises for you. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace.